Heritage Center here in Ashton. I live in Aurora, so it's kind of like being mayor of a town where you don't live. But I've been involved for about 10 years. One of the things that I do in life is videotape various special events. I've done weddings and so forth. At one point, Randy here, about six, eight years ago, um, wanted me to videotape a program on the Farwell Athletic Club that he was doing. And I felt, you know, as time went by, I, I felt it would be more and more appropriate to, to have it as part of our Polish Heritage Festival. It, uh, because, you know, even though baseball is certainly isn't a Polish game, we've made it our own. And Randy's going to talk to us a little bit about, about that today. That Randy Lukasiewicz from Farwell. Thanks, Larry. Well, like I said earlier, Church Day, it's really an honor to be invited to uh, the celebration. I've never been to it before, but... I was very impressed by the music, the uh, attendance, the spirit of uh, friendship and fellowship. So um, anyway, it's uh, not sure where to start, but like a friend of mine said, uh, baseball's in the Bible. And uh, in the beginning, that's how it starts out, in the beginning or is it the beginning? So I guess it's all in how you look at life and look at things. So it's all there. And... Uh, I guess in starting out that this will not be a whole lot necessarily about baseball and uh, probably not a whole lot about Farwell either. There'll be some, but anyway, what's, uh, what I do is like to take in a little journey that uh, I guess was a journey that I was on. And um, so, you know, life's affected by little things we do. I mean, we all affect each other's lives throughout our whole existence. So... I was thinking the other day, what are some peak events of my life? And um, so when I think back, one was uh, arrowhead hunting with Dada by Coatesfield. You know, years later, you know, just, um, I mean, that was a big deal. Uh, fourth grade, going to the state capitol, taking a train, you know, taking in all the state exhibits. I mean, that was Nebraska history. It was who we were. And then, you know, as I got older in life, I do recall real vividly, uh, the sounds of steel cleats and the wood bat, which almost you don't hear too much anymore either because of wood bats and, you know, cleats and stuff. But anyway, so it's kind of a journey of a, a little era that's uh, not here anymore. But uh, we are creating our own era. I mean, who we are and what we do now, we are creating something. And uh, so anyway, this is a little bit about Faro, but it could be any community, no matter where you're from. I mean, whatever town you're from, you know, big city, little city, still uh, Ashton Loop City, Bolas, Omaha. I mean, um, we can't get away from faith, attitude, and community. I mean, those are some pretty prime things important to our existence. So I'd have to say uh, uh, another one of the peak experiences of mine was uh, with visiting with my uncle probably 35, 40 years ago. He wanted to do, he was doing the family tree. Well, we have a big family, and uh, but it still just starts with one. So he had this whole sheet written out with some names, and I thought, well, this is a good idea. Part of it was thinking, how come this wasn't done before? How come my ancestors didn't do it? Where was their family tree? Well, as I got along realizing, you know, they were too busy living life. They didn't have time to record things, to do things. I mean, I think their life was one of, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. So um, as part of that, um, I thought I would give the talk in Polish today, you know, to kind of give a little little feeling for how it was back then. So I was going to have my daughter help me with this little project. As a little form of introduction... Moje Mimi Yaj Randy Ukashevitz. Good afternoon. My name is Randy Ukashevitz. Rosny we Farwell Stan, Nebraska we Ladika Tuja. I grew up in Farwell, Nebraska, not far from here. Brzuj Buzje, Zebi Wajje, Wojinski do Polskiano, Centrum, Dozinstwaja. I want to give thanks to the Polish Heritage Center. Zla Zabrosnia, me, 
Prozhnya Wanya We Gizi. For inviting me to come and speak to you today. Prabhuji Wibji Praja Wami Kawazami Tatami Mini Nazushi Se. I want to share with you what occurred to me. Sa Rajna Manya Ukashabits Rosnami Genealogy Sakuryu. And what I learned after I started my Lucas Savage family genealogy search. To Kali Rosnami Kali Mojna Nuzra Kurka Holly. It all started when my oldest daughter Holly. Brain Yurajni Trzinski Lada Timu Mam Nazinski Wazu Stima Brzinium. Was born 32 years ago. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Moj Korka Monika. I'm going to give it in Polish. My daughter Monika. Zemimna Tenumia Tejeku and Jeski. It's going to translate into English. Luke Zapwatch. Go with God. There's no way I'm going to give this in Polish. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this week I did it on the computer, and honestly, I was emotionally and physically drained in doing that. But in doing that, I had an amazing feeling for an immigrant. I mean, I thought back to my grandparents or great-grandparents. You think back maybe 100 years ago. I mean, I heard they did not, uh, couldn't speak their Polish language. I mean, I don't know, but still, I really got a feeling for an immigrant of totally talking a foreign language and understanding it. So... Thanks, Monica, for that. So um, anyway, this is a family tree that I had worked on and developed. And this is 30 years ago. And what was fortunate at that time, there were, I went to, I took what my uncle Mal had, and I went to the oldest people around to get their names and to add to it. So it's always changing, always evolving, but there it is. And uh, so that's... Um, ends up to be a big sheet of plywood. But basically, it's like I did my job. It's kind of like I uh, now there's something to build from. So um, anyway, that's uh, one step of the process. Once you get into it, it's just hard to really, you can't really backtrack and because one thing leads to the next. And uh, so I just started going from picture to picture and one interesting thing to another. This one is part of the pictures I found. Um, happens to be Ashton, so I couldn't resist showing this picture. And uh, this was whatever day, 10 to 6. Uh, Farwell's first, so I assume they beat Ashton because it doesn't say there. So however you interpret that to be. But anyway, it's interesting. Uh, with this picture, they all have stories. The people aren't here that were part of them, so it's kind of like developing what could have, should have, or did happen there. But interesting enough, when you came in, there's display of pictures there. Well, I made those to replicate how the fences were. It's just chicken wire and two by fours, basically, is all they used. So, you know, like I said, it's a different era of ball back then. They were probably portable. Set them up, take them down, and move on. I heard Farrell had three different ball fields, so. Anyway, um, so that one is uh, very interesting. This picture I did get from Lou Waltman, who's here in our presence here. And, um, but a very interesting photo. Another thing is with photos, they just don't involve men necessarily. With this photo, I talked to Phyllis Behoda Lukasavich and see if she had any stories of baseball, Sherman Howard League baseball. In this crowd here, how many have heard of Sherman Howard League baseball? Well, show of hands, about half of them. So uh, anyway, interesting going to her. She was in a very interesting dilemma. She was from Ashton. Her boyfriend at the time, Reynold Lukasiewicz, was from Farwell. So when Farwell plays Ashton, where's your loyalty, to your boyfriend or to your hometown? So there was a little crisis there. Yeah. Ashton. Yeah. <laughs> and we know how that story turned out, too. So uh, anyway, neither one of us are here anymore, but uh, still, you know, it's interesting, the stories there. Uh, 
I'm sure on occasion you've heard Faro Athletic Club mentioned, and uh, is there a Faro Athletic Club? Was there a Faro Athletic Club? I don't know. This picture intrigued me. It was one of the first pictures I found of my grandfather, who's right here. But all these guys have a shirt on that says FAC. So my deduction was either it was the Faro Athletic Club, it was the Farwell Arts Club, maybe not, Farwell uh, Ed Club. It could have, I don't know, Grandpa sold IH, but I wouldn't associate this with tractors or anything. But the Arts Club. Anyway, so I just left it Farwell Athletic Club. And no one's here to really uh, say if it is or isn't here, but still, I, uh, after looking at that and then finding out about the guys or the families, I took it to Farwell or to Faith, Attitude, and Community. You know, as I explored more the lives these guys lived, it was um, a life of faith and attitude and community. So that's kind of the story right now of the Faro Athletic Club. And uh, it's, um, but again, you know, it's very interesting to look at these photos. Black and whites have so much to say. You know, the angle, how they took the picture, where was it taken, or why was it taken, or on this photo is Paul Lukasiewicz, Roman Ganaster, Eddie Ganaster in the center, Louis Klonetsky, and Jack Jahorik. So uh, I'm sure some of these people you may have known or heard about, but uh, this was, uh, you know, one of the first pictures that really was intriguing to me. You know, as time goes by, you just don't know when you'll pop up a picture or where you'll find one. And um, this one was the 1932 Fence Busters. Uh, a couple years ago, a kid and his buddies from Murdoch were doing a tour of Nebraska to towns that were very interested in baseball. And uh, he saw the website where uh, actually a lot of this talk will, could be found. But anyway, he was intrigued by Farwell and the history of baseball and said, let's play ball games. So I said, that sounds like a good idea. So uh, at that point, didn't have any guys, didn't have any uniforms, didn't have a name or anything, but it sounded like a good idea to play ball. So uh, shortly after, found a picture that said Fence Busters and then got some guys together, and we did end up playing a ball game about three, four years ago. And... Uh, but again, the catcher's deal in the back, which is from Larry Lukasiewicz, is very similar to the one here. But, uh, you know, on this photo, just going from left to right, Johnny Mudluff, Johnny Pavleski, Jimmy Jewell, uh, a no one, Norm Peterson, who ended up playing for the cards. Uh, this is Percy Bellman and uh, Dan Hayes, Albert Horky. Eddie Borzik, uh, no one, Jack Jahorik, and Chick Peterson. Chick Peterson also went to play for the Cardinals. So uh, interesting history there. Out of uniform, you don't know if it's just a Sunday game. Chance are 50, 60 years ago, it would not have been an uncommon sight to see somebody like me walk around Ashton for a Sunday afternoon game. and Because uh, it was the Sherman Howard League was... Uh, Institute 100 years ago, so uh, a lot of history there. And um, in going through uh, photos, Larry Lukasiewicz mentioned to go talk to Irma Peterson and different people. Well, who's Irma Peterson? Well, found out that her uh, she was married to the Petersons, and her father-in-law was Chick Peterson. Well, that's where I got the scrapbook of Chick Peterson, 60 pages of, you know, scores, box scores, everything from 1912 on. But uh, as part of the journey, it was like, number one, naming these guys. Who are these guys? So uh, interesting enough, in this photo, I mean, there's just a lot of interesting things. Um, I found it in Omaha at a neighbor. So... Just, I guess, on a little genealogy kick, you never know when you'll find something or where you'll find it or what it'll say, but it was the size of your driver's license. And uh, I was at a party, and the, my neighbors said, um, who were good in the who are related, I think, to the Kalkowskis with connections back here. And also, uh, they uh, 
he said my dad played and lived, played ball and lived in Farwell. So that piqued my interest. Plus, they went hunting around Farwell. Well, that was a big deal for a lot of Omaha folks and families to come back to out here to Farwell Ashton, go hunting. And uh, if you're at the Piccolo's Barbershop in Omaha, South 10th Street, go in there. I was in there one day, eight people in there. It's the size of a five confessionals, full of pictures. But uh, half of New Farwell, and there's pictures of Farwell Ashton. Stories were that the, the guys would, you know, fill the car with food, come out here, because it was kind of tough times for the farmers. And they would bring food and, for the farmers in exchange for hunting. So, I mean, it goes back a long ways, the connection to families here and families there. But with this one, the first thing I did was blew it up. It's like, who are these people? So I looked at the era. But this one was special because, well, a lot of ways. I mean, just how they laid out the bats, the look. I mean, it looked professionally done. And uh, besides that, the little kid in the front, you know, the little bat boy. But of all the people, the one that got my interest was uh, this, little, this picture back here in the corner. And it's like it's a long shot. To me, looking at the date on it, this would have been my dad's era. And uh, in fact, these are his pants I got on. But uh, back from the 40s, nice wool pants. But the point is, uh, I thought, you know, that looks like Roy Olson, who I knew was a dad, a friend of my dad's. And I'm sure some of you may know Roy. And uh, anyway, he's one of two that are still living. Roy Olson and this little guy here is uh, Galen Jackson. It was in Rock Rapids, Iowa. But I... Uh, made a big copy of it, and I sent it to Roy, and I says, either I hit a home run or struck out, but this has to be you on this photo. And sure enough, it was him. So he and Dorothy came over one day and sat and named half the guys on that picture. And then within six months, someone else appeared, and we named the other half. But uh, Dilla's Tavern, this is George Dilla, and uh, he's on some photos in back. He really was one of the founders of the Sherman Howard League. Never played baseball in his life, loved baseball. And, um, but the others are, uh, this is uh, Galen, here's his dad, H.T. Jackson. And uh, kind of Ashton Ames, Spotty Kukowski, Clifford Jewell, Howard Waltman, the gentleman in the center, Jim Jewell, Albert Horky, Freddie Hankins, Johnny Fableski. Then the front row is Roman Mudluff, Victor Mudluff, Paul Zaleski. Here's Ray Goodenrath whose family I got this from, Galen Jackson, uh, Donald Kipp, who went on to play for the Padres, and uh, Butch Borjic, Roy Olson, and Dominic Dershinsky. So um, anyway, a couple of years ago, I was in contact with um, Galen, and he gave me yearbooks from the 40s and the, all kinds of stuff. But he also had like a 30-page history of Farwell, and he called it uh, Remembering the Past. But anyway... Here he is, a little kid. This is what he wrote in the beginning of his book. Remembering is the basis for knowledge and reason because the capacity to learn depends upon memory. The accumulation of experience not only from our own lifetimes but from lifetimes across the ages. Our consciousness of the past is of stories, evolving autobiographies, and that explain who we were, who we are, that whisper of our own intimate aspirations. We create ourselves from stories that can join us to places, bind us to each other, blend individual and communal identities, provide definition, context, continuity, perspective, and personality. So uh, it's amazing how just from, you know, picture, finding a picture from one thing leads to the other, what can really develop from that? Interesting thing with the Dilla family, there were three boys and um, I knew a couple of them. Actually, I knew all three of them. And over time, I, uh, the oldest, Gilbert, never played ball. But I'm thinking that he probably is the one that, <clears throat> excuse me, probably responsible for all the pictures. He was the town correspondent. And there's I've got an amazing amount of articles and pictures taken then undoubtedly he took and wrote and recorded. So um, anyway, this is kind of an interesting photo. You never know what you'll find. 
And um, this one also, it's interesting to also to try and find out where it was. And those of you that remember Farwell in the field at the bottom of the hill, in my estimation, this is it because the road curves down, the cottonwoods aren't there. I mean, that was pretty much a staple of the big cottonwoods outside the field there. But um, anyway, it's an interesting photo of probably a maybe a fall day. It looks like Jack's got a sweater on. But, you know, it's interesting the stories with these people. Uh, when I asked... Uh, Roy Olson, something about Jack Jehoric, he said, he's the only guy I know that could pump gas and smoke a cigarette at the same time. So, <laughs> you know, those you knew Jack could probably attest to that, too. And, uh, but developing from this, too, is uh, some years ago, I was in contact with his daughter, Dolores Knudsen from Grand Island, an artist. She says, if you ever find a, uh, a uh, picture, let me know, and I'll paint a photograph of it. Anyway, she did, I thought she'd be here today, but she painted a picture of uh, the field, and it's about this big. It's of the Dominsky field. And uh, so, again, that uh, wasn't just a men's sport. She recalls, too, when her dad was manager, that her Sunday afternoon would be, you know, church, going home, eat, and then uh, I think it was, no, first church, and then her dad was a manager, Always an issue of making sure he had a pitcher and a catcher. That was, that was crucial. And then go to the ballpark and then back afterwards for, I think, a chicken dinner and stuff. But anyway, very, very fond, powerful memories of Sunday afternoon baseball. <clears throat> um, I don't know if you've heard of Richard Rohr, but uh, he's a Franciscan priest, but... His comments are in baseball is um, the relationship in, between fathers and his sons and daughters is too deep for words and touches upon primal and foundational longing. A son and daughter want dad to give them his male energy and then they want to know that they have something to give back to their father almost as an equal. Why do you think playing catch is such a common memory for so many men? They do not want to just be the receiving again. It is the mutual self-giving of the father and his children that creates spirit, which is the basic metaphor for God in much of John's gospel. Maybe love for the father is the first experience of power and influence in the life of another. For mom is apparently experienced as an extension of me, but dad is the first other to come into my life. If I can matter, for, matter to him and for him, perhaps I can matter in the larger world. So, again, it wasn't just uh, Sunday afternoon. You know, it, it's uh, the game of ball is about life and energy and faith, attitude, community, um, which leads me to this photo, which also is one of my uh, uh, favorite photos. Um, before I get to that, uniform to the left, uh, interesting enough, came from a Daryl Kritzky. He used to be a Farwell resident, but he uh, lived north of Farwell. He loved to go to school there. He loved playing ball there. He just loved to be part of the community. And uh, I met him during the centennial 25 years ago. I kept getting these letters from some guy in Omaha. I didn't know who he was. He'd draw little cartoons, and he'd give crazy ideas and suggestions. Like, who is this guy? He'd spell things funny and just... Anyway, he says, I can give you good ideas because I don't live there. So here, do what you want with them. So anyway, we uh, got to be really good friends. And after Daryl passed on some years after that, um, he'd invited me to a Curseal, uh, which was a good experience for both of us and um, creating a great sense of faith community and also <clears throat> when he died the family gave me a couple boxes of stuff and I had no idea what was in there and uh, when I opened up the box immediately I knew that it was something pretty special just the smell of it and the further I got into it that was in there it was Daryl's uniform as far as I know it's the only one left from Farwell and uh, 
So it's pretty special. And then in back, there's a, a lot of the photos, a lot of the clippings. An interesting thing about the past, too, that uh, I just realized is, for me, a, a special time in my life was kindergarten. And I just remembered as a, uh, I don't know why, I just could never, it was just a fun year for some reason. It's the only year I went to Farrell High School was kindergarten. So uh, anyway, fast forward kindergarten years later, going through Daryl's stuff, going through piecing it together and everything. He uh, um, had it here. He put together, it was a media guide from 1955 and 56. That's the year Farrell went to state in basketball. They went undefeated all year and uh, had a phenomenal year at the reserves, the volleyball. Almost everybody was undefeated. And uh, when I look back on it, I had no idea they went to state. I had uh, absolutely no idea. But when I think back of, you know, the streets full of people, all that activity and energy and going on, then I read the articles that made perfect sense why weekend nights or Wednesday nights were just packed full of people and stuff. So anyway, because of that, uh, the chapter, the story of that got written in a book a couple of years ago. It's called Vanishing Hardwoods. It's about small towns and sports basketball history. And uh, so anyway, that's the story of the uniform, but that also brought a lot of other pictures and photos and things. And um, this photo is special too. It... Um, well, my grandfather's on it. That's why I had a copy, because of the genealogy search. He's in the front here. But when I look back and look through that, immediately it's like, as soon as you can, name him. Find out who's on there. And uh, <clears throat> so now I feel like, um, in ways, these are uh, heroes. They're legends. They're men. They're guys from the past. But you know, I know them from a photo. I deliver newspapers to some of them. You know, I know their story and uh, just more about them. Um, you know, Dan Hayes, years ago when I first did the first celebration Larry was making reference to, Saturday morning before, I get a call, or I think my sister Amy does, from uh, Helen Bettinger and her dad's pictures in the paper. I put this in the Independent. And she called and says, my dad's on that picture. Well, what are the chances of really finding some of these people or who are they or what's their life story? But anyway, this is her dad and said she wrote a bio on him. He, he caught for Grover Cleveland Alexander. He went to service and he uh, was a little shell-shocked. He got some injuries because of that. But uh, chances are any of you have gone to Omaha on Highway 92, you've driven right by his place. In the last few years, I found out that Hayes Feed Yard sign between uh, the Platte River and Osceola on the north side, that's Hayes Feed Yard. That was where Dan lived and his family lives now. So uh, interesting with stories. Charlie Hansen, my grandfather, Uncle Beanie, or that's what we called him, our uh, uncle. He had the produce shop, Main Street, Farwell. I just knew him as Beanie, but uh, didn't know he played baseball. And uh, since he's passed on, I've got his collection of holy cards from uh, when you go to a funeral home. That was his kind of thing. He saved holy cards. And it's amazing what connection that is to genealogy. You know, to really find out who his friends were, you know, of people back years ago, you know, their, um, where they lived, their birth date. I mean, it's amazing. It's just a little thing. But how um, impactful it is. And um, again, there's Jack Jehorik and um, my grandfather. Interesting thing about this photo, here's the banner of it. I made a replica over on the right here. So uh, anyway, um, another important part of this is everybody's in uniform except one guy. Again, it's like, here's a championship photo. And this fellow back here is out of uniform. And it's like, again, what's the story? You know, what's the deal? And uh, so it's like, you know, this is, it's a big deal. It's a championship photo. So, again, that's kind of one of the beginning things of, like, 
how do I find out about these people? Another one was, uh, this is one more story. Arnold Harvey, during the centennial, well, 25 years ago, I remember I had this photo hanging in a building with all the centennial things. And this gentleman came up and I said something, or who are you? And he says, this is me on the photo. That was Arnold Harvey. And uh, so I just, I think at the time, just kind of went over and I didn't really connect with him much. But to have met the guy is pretty cool. And, um, but before I get into uh, another bits of this and kind of wrap it up, I wanted to just uh, read a couple things or share things that occurred to me this week on why there's Polish heritage or what that means or what's why we're here, why you guys are here. And uh, it turns out that there's a, a um, it's with culture, there's like the physical culture, the heritage of the Polish center, the building across the way here. Your towns and communities probably have places where there's towns, buildings, artifacts, things, which is an important way of remembering, of preserving. Then there's the intangible. It's the things of value, the things that you can't really see. And it's like this. How do you put, how do you define faith, attitude, and community? How do you do that? That's one of the hardest to carry on and to preserve. Then the final one is uh, the natural. You know, the floral, the fauna, the outdoors, the grasses, the, you know, the places of uh, more in the natural settings, which could be a ballpark. You know, any of you from Omaha been to Brown Park, South Omaha? Prime example of a ball field stuck in the middle of some green pastures. But the other connecting thing, important thing, it's also cemeteries. So, you know, that too is a place of value, of importance. So that kind of defines the importance of Days like today, coming here, coming back, bring your kids. I mean, really, it's it's a real live thing. And um, but um, so, in light of remembering and preserving and gathering information, when I in my search, Larry Lukasevich one afternoon says, "Why don't you go down to?" Um, he says, "This is Howard Waltman." He, Larry, caught with him and you know said he's. Amazing story. He used to live in Omaha. I mean, live in Farwell. He had moved away, and he thought the family, some lived in the Crete area. Well, it just turns out that weekend, I was going to southeast Nebraska. I went down there, stopped in, stopped at the, um, some places there, ended up that uh, found out they have a whole complete softball field complex named after Howard Waltman. And... Uh, so this really intrigued me. Well, shortly, like a week or two later, I got in contact with Lou Waltman and uh, kind of began putting stories and things together and pictures. And um, so it's like, I just kind of need to know more about this. Well, this was Howard. I just knew Howard from photos. He was on the earliest photo. He was on some of the latest photos. He just played 30 years. The guy loved baseball. He supposedly played with Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth. He had an amazing story. He was, I think it was Atlanta Crackers maybe. When he was 18, he went down there to play. And uh, so, uh, um, um, Kaiser, uh, Lauren's grandfather. Can't think of his name. Anyway, he knew Howard. He said he didn't have a straight finger on his hand because of being a catcher for 30 years. I mean, think of being a catcher for that long. So, I mean, the guy literally loved baseball. So, but anyway, he uh, grew up around Farwell and then traveled, the, got married and traveled the state and, you know, was very involved with activities. He loved community plays and loved the community, which I thought, oh, this is interesting and stuff. So, uh, anyway, it turned out that, uh, found out that once he retired, quote, retired, he moved to Crete he and his wife set up a league for the kids, adults, got a station wagon, bought the equipment, loaded the kids. He started this league for, he's probably in his 50s or 60s, and started this for the whole community there. So out of appreciation, they named this whole complex the Howard Waltman Complex. So it's down there if you're ever there. But interesting enough, you know, it's like 
here, I'm sure the people of Farwell knew, number one, hardly anyone there remembers this era anyway. No one would know that he had that post-life. I'm sure no one in Crete knows his pre-life. Anyway, but I guess the point is of, um, you never know the impact or the power of life one person. Howard came to um, Howard County in, as a five-year-old on the orphan train. He was, uh, uh, his folks I think died both with the flu or some epidemic in New York. But I mean, I guess the point is one person, one life, you know, for an orphan to look at the trail. I mean, that's, uh, you know, when I gather all this information, it's just amazing the story that, you know, the impact again of one person, one life. And to look at uh, most recently in the last couple months, I've uh, been in contact, well, a lot with Dan Dilla. He's got photos of community plays. And Howard was in those things. You know, it's, it's kind of like no bull. I mean, he was involved in the community. So, I mean, all this kind of makes sense. I think there was a, uh, something to the life of faith, attitude in the community, no matter where you're at or what you're doing. The other thing, I guess, is part of um, this celebration is the cemeteries. You know, it's, we're kind of going from one ball field to the next. It's kind of from Main Street where these guys, you know, put together activities, events to kind of keep Main Street going to a ball field that kind of kept things going. As part of that, my grandfather was an undertaker in Farwell. So with his undertaking records, it too has got the life, death, and stories of people. And, uh, but it's kind of like, what's the big deal about a cemetery? Or what's important about a Catholic cemetery? Or it's kind of like the next step here. For those that are interested, there's the Farwell tour. And it doesn't have to be the Farwell tour, but the cemeteries are for your own choice. Um, so anyway, there's a handout before you leave. And uh, be sure and take that. But I'd just like to share a little story on that too as I work with a young gal. And she's probably mid-20s. But just recently, she was telling the story where she was... Uh, her grandfather died some years ago and lived in the same house that her grandfather did. So it's probably 65 years of existence living in South Omaha, gathering things. And, you know, the family obviously always was like, come on, Grandma, time to... Uh, why don't you sell the house or move or do something? But she was content. She was okay with where it was at. So anyway, uh, she was just determined to stay there. I mean, she had no reason to want to leave or anything. So anyway, Jenny decided one day to um, make a trip to the cemetery. So she stopped and, you know, went by to visit her grandpa's grave there. And she says, Grandpa, will you give Grandma a sign to sell the house? And uh, anyway... Make a long story short, a week later, Grandma decided, you know, it's time to move. Let's go. Let's sell this stuff. A month or two later, the house sold. So uh, anyway, that's the honest truth, but I'm just going to read one final thing that is part of the handout. It's, um, it didn't come out too clear, but I'll just read it, and uh, you'll have it there. Then after that, there's just one small recording I want to share with you. But the, our understanding of death is an integral part of the Christian vision of reality. Uh, is particularly important in our current culture. So often is it infected with a humanistic and secularistic orientation which views death as the ultimate disaster of life. Too many would attempt to ignore or push aside the reality of death in the hope that it will not interfere with the living of the life. The church, through its teachings, its liturgy, its cemeteries, provides for us a healthy, realistic, and hopeful understanding of death. In a special way, our Catholic cemeteries stand as a visible reminders of and witnesses to the Christian understanding of death, life, and resurrection. The body is laid to rest in our Catholic cemetery with a powerful dignity, where it remains in an atmosphere of devotion, reverence, and respect of our Catholic faith. Not only is it the Reliquary, the remains of the deceased, is an important place for the living. Here in the Catholic cemetery, we the living can come to know and appreciate 
more fully our relationship with death and the essential aspects of our Catholic vision of reality. For this reason, we should look to the Catholic cemetery as a sacred place, which is very much a part of our life. We encourage to visit the graves of our loved ones and to use these occasions to strengthen our faith and the meaning of life, death, and resurrection, which give meaning and hope to us all that become our grace of the Lord. To wrap it up, I'm just going to have a little, um, few words from Dan Dilla, who would be, uh, he'd be here if he could make it today. This would, uh, his dad's the one who was the manager that started the league, and uh, he's going to share a few things with us here. Thank you. 